All right, good morning. We, we out there, everybody awake? All right. Well, as David said, we are continuing with our study in 1 John. And today I've entitled uh, the sermon, Three Denials of a Heretic. Now that sounds ominous, doesn't it? But uh, we'll explain what, what all that means. Three Denials of a heretic. And our, our text, we're actually going to go back and pick up a few verses from last week. So uh, the, the verses that I'm going to be preaching this morning is our verses 6 through 10. And before we begin, let, let me just, you know, let's just go to the Lord in prayer. <clears throat> Dear gracious Heavenly Father, we, we think about who you are. We think about the fact that before time began for infinity, there was you. And we don't know why, but we know that you did create us, and you made us perfectly. And then we, we sinned against you, and uh, we, we chose our own ways, our own desires, our own headship over yours. But Lord, even before the foundation of the earth was laid, you already had a plan for our redemption, for our salvation to those who trust in you. And God, we give you praise for that we get to give you praise that you have made a way for us to be restored to relationship and fellowship with you. Oh God, as we look at your word this morning, <clears throat> I pray that we would see the truths contained there within and that it would change our life. It would sharpen our uh, thoughts. We would grow in wisdom and that you would feed us and speak to us from your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, as we've said, John is addressing uh, the Gnostic heresies that were plaguing the early church. John continues to address the false teachings and beliefs of these Gnostic um, false believers. He systematically, even in verse 1, systematically shows the differences between true Christianity and false belief. And he does not want true believers to be swayed or to be deceived by false teachers. John was in an all-out battle against heresy. Now, heresy, what, what, what does heresy mean? Heresy is defined as believing or holding in to an opinion that is contrary to orthodox religion. For example, the Gnostics denied the virgin birth. They denied that Jesus was fully God and fully man. They denied the sinless nature of Christ. They denied the substitutionary death of Christ on the cross, and they denied that it was sufficient. All of those beliefs are what we call foundational or orthodox beliefs, and to deny those is to deny the faith. <clears throat> now, there are many, many so-called churches out there who are... Uh, are essentially cults because they deny, they deny the orthodox beliefs. The Gnostics, because they held to these heresies, were then heretics. Um, and of course, a heretic is someone who believes uh, in those non-orthodox beliefs. As your pastor from day one, I said that I had three goals. What and they and they are to preach, to pray and to protect. Now, preaching and praying may not need an explanation. We, we get that, but protecting might. And, and what I want to always do is to protect you from false teaching. And one of the ways in which a pastor can do this is through teaching you what the Bible says, but also warning you about potential threats. And this is the very same thing that John is doing in his epistle. <clears throat> this morning, my goal is to point out three denials that, that heretics make and that they were making from our passage. If we look at verses 6 and 7, we see, number one, that a heretic denies their walk breaks fellowship. They deny their walk breaks fellowship. John says, if we say that we have fellowship with him, while we walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. First, 
a heretic ignores the fact of the reality of their sins. They claim to have fellowship with God or to have special revelation from God, but they are deceived. Though they walk in darkness, though they walk in sin, they claim to be bearers of the light. They claim to have an eternal life, yet they are spiritually dead. Their claims are meaningless, and the barrenness of their life proves that they have no spiritual life. Jesus speaks to this in Matthew 7, 15 through 20. He says, beware of false prophets or heretics who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. You will recognize them by their fruits. Are grapes gathered from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? So every healthy tree bears good fruit, but the diseased tree bears bad fruit. A healthy tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a diseased tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown to the, into the fire. Thus you will recognize them by their fruits. Every tree that does not produce food will be thrown into the fire. This is what he's saying. False teachers will claim, heretics will claim that they have new life, but they bear no fruit of the Spirit. They produce nothing that would show a person that they are a Christian. And what he means by these trees who never bear fruit, they prove that they are lost. And what he means by they will be thrown into the fire, he is talking about those who do not have true faith, when they die, they will, be, they will be separated from God in hell for eternity. Jesus is describing those who have no faith or false faith. Heretics or false teachers cannot produce fruit because the light is not in them. An apple, if a tree is not an apple tree, it cannot produce an apple. If you are not a true believer, you cannot produce the fruit of the Spirit. You cannot do that because you've not been born again. If we profess one thing and then live a life that is contrary to those claims, we lie and the truth is not within us. James, in his pastoral epistle, says in James 1, 22 through 25, be, but be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man who looks intently at his face in a mirror. For he looks at himself and goes away and at once forgets what he was like. But the one who looks into the perfect law, the law of liberty, and perseveres, being no hearer who forgets, but a doer who acts, he will be blessed in what he's doing. That person will bear fruit and prove that he is a child of God. John MacArthur states uh, from this passage, he says, believers possess God's life. They are new creations in Christ made for good works, and they have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Thus, they cannot ignore the existence of a personal iniquity and a walk in darkness. No matter what anyone claims for himself, the genuineness of faith can always be seen in one's life by the love of righteousness. Modern day heretics seem to be far more subtle these days. This makes it very difficult when you're watching YouTube or when you're listening to a podcast to discern truth from falsehood. Some modern heretics, instead of denying they are sinful, or, or, or saying that they, instead of denying they are sinful, they just have decided to simply never mention sin at all. It doesn't exist. It's not important. You'll hear them say things like, sin isn't a pleasant thing to discuss. So we don't, we're not going to talk about sin. Um, I hope I have his name right, but Robert Mueller, who is the founder of the Crystal Cathedral, this was his theme, that we will not talk about sin. We will never mention sin. We will never address sin. We will only focus on other things. Some of these uh, modern-day false teachers say 
we, we don't want to make anyone feel bad about themselves or we don't want to put anyone off. These statements are very popular among those who seek to make faith more man-centered than centered on God. However, without the bad news that we are sinners, there is no good news. Without recognizing our need for salvation because of sin, there is no salvation. So if we say we have fellowship with him, but we are still walking in unrepentant, unconfessed sin, unforgiven sin, we are lying to ourselves and to others. We are not practicing the truth. But if we walk in the light, the light of God, that proves that we have fellowship with God. And it proves that the blood of Jesus Christ has cleansed us from all our sin. Beware of anyone who refuses to mention sin. We, we, we sometimes in our day treat it like a bad word. But the only way we can be healed is to know what afflicts us and what afflicts us is sin. Beware of the one who never mentions it. So firstly, they deny their walk breaks fellowship with God. This is the first denial of a heretic. The second denial is they deny their need for confession. Verses 8 and 9 says, if we say we have no sin, so this is, this is adding on to what the, the, what the verse 6 and 7 says. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. That's a reiteration of what he just said. But if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Did you know that over the years, some have claimed that when one is saved, he or she can somehow uh, or is already somehow sinless or can attain a sinless nature? Some believe that as Christians, we can, uh, we can reach a higher plane of sinless existence. However, this is a very ex extremely proud and arrogant way to think of oneself. As Christians, we are sanctified, which means we are set apart to do the work of God, but we are not glorified. And, and what glorified means is we are not perfect. We are not perfected. For the Christian who is sanctified, once we reach heaven's gates, God will perfect us. He will glorify us, but we're not there yet. To claim the glorification is and can be reached on earth, why we are here on this earth, is a gross misrepresentation of biblical truth. If a so-called believer holds to this truth, it only serves to prove that they do not have the true faith they claim to have. When we are saved, it is not that we are righteous and perfect, but that the perfection and righteousness of Christ is imbued to us. We are credited with it. In Romans 3, Paul strings together a series of Old Testament quotations that speak of the sinful nature of man. He says in Romans 3, 10 through 12, as it is written, none is righteous. No, not one. No one understands. No one seeks for God. All have turned aside. Together they have become worthless. No one does good, not even one. This speaks a volume of truth. Before we come to Christ, we cannot be good enough to attain salvation. And post-salvation, we must always be reminded of the great work that Christ has done and is doing in our life. Holding us fast to the Father. Uh, bear with me as I read a quote from a commentator named John Stott. He, he talks about the, the second claim, the second denial of of heretics. He says that, that it's worse than the very first denial. Namely, he says that to be without sin or to be sinless is a worse claim than to deny that what they, how they're living breaks fellowship. He says the first heretical claim at least appeared to concede the existence of sin while denying that it had the effect of estranging the sinner from God. Now what they're saying in, in this section is the very fact that sin is denied. These people cannot benefit from the cleansing effects of the blood of Jesus because they claim to be without sin. Sin is again in the singular and refers to the inherited principle of sin or self-centeredness. 
The heretics are now saying, whatever their outward conduct may be, there is no sin inherent in their nature. This is un unbiblical. Being, becoming saved does not mean that we stop sinning. But what it means is that we have been saved from the ramifications of our sin. We have been preserved. We have been imbued by the righteousness of Christ. We have been set apart for the glory of God. As a Christian, our sins have been completely forgiven. However, we still commit sin. We, we were just talking, we, we talk about this all the time. We still go on sinning. A true believer is greatly aware of his or her sin and will acknowledge that sin to God. Confessing our sins to God allows us to enjoy proper fellowship with him. Let me ask you this. Do you practice regular confession of your sin? I'm not talking about do you, do you go and, and confess your sins to a priest or to a pastor or to someone else, but do you in your prayers admit to God where you have sinned, the errors of your ways? When a true Christian sins, that sin does not break the relationship he has with God, but it can damage the relationship. He doesn't lose, he, she doesn't lose uh, their salvation but the relationship can be strained. We know from John 10, 27 through 30, that no one is able to snatch us out of the hand of God once we are saved. Not even we can lose our salvation. Though we cannot lose our salvation, we can damage the fellowship that we have with God. There is a difference between relationship and fellowship. Let me give you an example. I know the married couples in here have never fought. We just live perfectly righteous lives, right? No, no problems, no issues. Uh, you live uh, a rosy life, right? <laughs> no, if you're married, you, you've had an argument, maybe one or two. But a married couple are at odds with one another. Uh, they might be really angry with each other. They may have had a fight or an argument, but they're still married. But their fellowship, because of that argument, has obviously been damaged because of an angry word or a disagreement. In order for the husband and wife to restore fellowship, they must admit the wrong and, and, and experience reconciliation. Once this occurs, the fellowship is restored. However, the relationship never ended. The same is true with God. Our relationship, once we are saved, it will never end. But when we sin, our fellowship will be, will be damaged. And confession to God, he already knows what we've done. He's already forgiven everything we've done. But confessing and admitting what we've done cleans the slate and allows us to have a deeper and genuine fellowship together. And this is a mark of genuine conversion, genuine Christians. This is why confession is so important. Let me, let me talk to you for a moment about confession. Paul, if you'll go ahead and bring up the next slide. Uh, it's going wrong? Uh-oh. Okay, you have to take your notepads out because I'm, I'm going to list. I'm going to give you three things about confession. Um, here are three things to consider when we think about confession. And by the way, if you'd like these, send me an email later, and I'll, I'll send you uh, everything that I'm, I'm sharing with you. First of all, we need to understand our need for confession. And, and in that, we need to understand that we are sinners. The truth is not in us. We will continue to sin. We also need to remember in our need for confession that God is faithful to forgive us. Hey, there we go. Good job, Paul. Uh, thank, thank, I, like, I appreciate Paul. He does a good work over here. There it is on the screen. Our need, need for confession. First of all, remember that we are sinners. We need to understand that God is faithful to forgive us. We also need to understand that God is not a liar. He says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful to forgive us of our sins. Secondly, in this idea of confession, we need to understand the process of confession. Let's see if we have that slide, Paul. The next one. The process of confession, which is, first, we need to agree with God that you have sinned. Okay, let's give an example. Let's say that I, I said a really harsh and angry word to someone. 
And I, in my prayer time, um, I have asked for their forgiveness, but in my prayer time, I say, Lord, I was really awful to, to so-and-so today. I, I, I sinned against you. I, I used an angry words. I, I sinned with anger and pride. I confess that to you. Um, Lord, forgive me of this sin. God, when he hears the confession, he will forgive you. So give thanks that he has already forgiven you. And then repent of your sins. Repent means to turn away from that sin. So when we come, we need to understand the need of our conf for confession as a believer. We need to understand that there is a process in confession that we admit our sin. We give thanks for God's forgiveness. And then we turn away from that sin and we don't repeat it. And then lastly, we need to understand the benefit of confession, which is on the last slide, Paul. The, the benefit of confession. If we look at Psalm 119, 26, he says, when I told of my ways, you answered me, teach me your statutes. What is the benefit of confession? Well, the benefit is that God hears our confession. When we pray to God, when we share with him what, where we have gone wrong, where we have sinned, he hears that confession. We must understand that another benefit of confession is that God responds. He will always respond to the, his child when he confesses our sins. And then also another benefit of that confession is that God will correct our behavior. How does he correct our behavior? As we are in his word. God has given us everything that we need to know about how to live life and to be obedient to him. A true Christian will practice regular confession because he or she will know that there is a need for confession. They will understand the process of confession and they will understand that there are great benefits to confessing our sin to Christ. The proper Christian, the true Christian attitude with regards to sin is to always admit it and to never deny it. We are to confess it, repent of it, and receive forgiveness for it. To not do so is most likely to admit you might not. Either one or two things. If you're not a regular confessor to Christ of your sin, either you've never heard of this before, or you know about it and you just don't practice it because the truth is not in you. Let me, let me, let me make this uh, statement. I think a part of all of your private time of prayers should be a recognition of where you have come and fallen short of the glory of God. Not that your relationship as a Christian is in jeopardy, but you don't want there to be anything in the way of your, of your fellowship with God. Um, it, is, it is recognizing where you have fallen short and also admitting that Christ is the only one to restore that fellowship. Uh, John Stott says that this forgiveness and cleansing issuing from the faithfulness and justice of God are conditional upon confession. There are many warnings in scripture about the dangers of concealing our sin. Does God not see our sin? No, he sees everything. So there is a danger in concealing our sins. And many promises, on the other hand, of blessing when we confess our sins. Moreover, he says, what is required is not a general confession of sin, but a particular confession of our particular sins, deliberately calling them to mind and deliberately confessing and forsaking them. Again, modern heretics, modern false teachers don't want you to feel as though you have anything to confess. They say, God wants you to be the best self you can be. And they say, stop believing the lies that you aren't good enough because God loves you just the way you are. How many have heard that? Anyone will admit? We hear this all the time. Friends, Listen to me carefully. God's love is conditional. God's love is conditional. Let me read a, a quote from uh, an excerpt from, from R.C. Sproul. He says, It has become fashionable in evangelical circles to speak somewhat glibly of unconditional love of God. 
It is certainly a pleasing message for people to hear and conforms to a certain kind of political correctness. And our desire to communicate to people the sweetness of the gospel, the readiness of God to cover our sins with forgiveness, and the incredible depth of his love displayed on the cross, we indulge in a hyperbolic expression, the scope and extent of his love. He goes on. Where in scripture do we find this notion of unconditional love? If God's love is absolutely unconditional, why do we tell people that they have to repent and have faith in order to be saved? God sets forth clear conditions for a person to be saved. It may be true that in some sense, God loves even those who fail to meet the conditions of salvation, but that subtly is often missed by the hearer when the preacher declares the unconditional love of God. People hear that God will continue to love them and accept them no matter what they do or how they live. We might as well declare an unabashed universalism as we declare to the uh, as we declare the unconditional love of God without a clear without a clear and careful qualification of what that means. Here's what it means. In Christ, the obstacle of the estrangement is overcome. The obstacle of our sin is overcome through Christ, and we are reconciled to God. But that reconciliation extends only to believers. Those who reject Christ remain at odds with God, estranged from God, and the objects of both his wrath and of his abhorrence. Whatever kind of love God has for the, uh, for the sinner, it does not exclude his just uh, hatred and abhorrence of the sinner, which stands in stark contrast to his redeeming love. God's love is conditional. What is it conditional on? It is conditional on our relationship with Christ. Now, let me say this. I love my nieces and nephews. I really do. But I don't love them like I love my children. I would do many things for my, my nieces and nephews, but I would do anything for my children. God has created all things. And in a, in, in a true sense, Every person who lives on planet Earth is, is God's creation, but not everyone is God's child. And so there is different love for all of creation than there is for the, his children, because there is conditional love. And if we espouse as Christians that there's no, we don't need to talk about sin, we're all good, we're all, no, we're all just, we're all okay, then we're espousing a faith that isn't true and that will lead the multitudes to never come to Christ because we ignore the truth about sin and we ignore the truth of what it means to be saved. If we believe that we are not sinners, we have, uh, we have no need of repentance and confession and that God's love is unconditional, then we will never ever have a clear understanding of our lostness and the gospel or what it means to truly be saved. So I said earlier, we must, we must beware of those who never mention sin. We also must beware of those who never encourage you to confess your sins. They deny their walk breaks fellowship. Number two, they deny their need for confession. And number three, if you want to go back to that first slide, they deny their, um, their conduct is sinful. They deny that their conduct is sinful. Verse 10 says, if we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. A heretic sees no problem with their fellowship with God. They see no need for confession. And this is because fundamentally, they do not believe they are sinners. Gnostic heretics maintain that their superior enlightenment, that they had special knowledge, made them incapable of sinning. But John is very clear from the outbreak of, of this letter that, that sin is reflective of our, our behavior and who we truly are. There are consequences to it. This, that, that, that we are not sinners and we have no need for Christ is an outrageous claim. The Gnostics would say that they have no longer they are no longer sinning and they are no longer in sin they have no need for confession 
And in that, what they're saying is that God is a liar because God's word says the opposite. Paul tells Titus in, in the first part of uh, Titus that God is not a liar. God is not a liar. He cannot lie. And as we talked about last Sunday evening, God is the personification of truth. He says in his word that we have all sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And so it is true. We are all sinners. And to deny the certainty of sin is a grievous error. If we claim that we are not a sinner, it indicates that we are covering up or holding on to a sin that we don't want to come to light. We are playing a dangerous and deceptive game. And as I mentioned earlier, the eyes of the Lord are in every place, keeping watch on the evil and the good. Proverbs 15, 3. A false teacher, a heretic, a non-believer seeks to cover up and hide and deny their sin. And this is a mark of their unregenerate life. A true believer openly admits, willingly confesses, and resolutely repents of his or her sin. And that is a mark of their new birth. In the last week or so, I want to want to make mention of this because it, it really burdened me. A tweet, I hope I'm saying that right, a tweet by a very popular American pastor has gone viral. Uh, because of its shocking lack of biblical truth. Uh, the pastor's name is Stephen Furtick. He's the pastor of Elevation Church, and Elevation Church is in Charlotte, North Carolina. And this is what his tweet said. It said, following Jesus doesn't change you into something else. It reveals who you've been all along. What would it be like to see you, to see the you that God sees? This tweet and quote was taken from a sermon that Mr. Furtick preached on Sunday, the 24th of October, in which he said this, the process of discipleship is not God changing you into something else. It is him revealing who you've been all along. And what I would say to Mr. Furtick is that what we've been all along is sinful and in need of God's forgiveness. But this, this sermon quote and tweet is shocking on many fronts because uh, Mr. Furtick is a graduate of a very prestigious seminary in America. He has 6.3 million followers on Facebook. Elevation Church's worship music is sung and used by churches all around the world. Yet Mr. Furtick does not have the basic grasp on what the gospel is and what the gospel does for those who believe, nor does he understand what discipleship is. We are sinful. Christ does not, if Christ does not change us, we cannot have a relationship with God, much less fellowship with God. He sees us not as good enough, but he sees us as sinners. When we are saved, he then sees us clean only because he sees not us, but he sees Christ. One of the most neglected theological truths in all of scripture is that you must be born again. You cannot stay where you are spiritually. You must be changed. You must be radically changed. You must be born again, as Jesus uh, says in John 3, chapter 3. We must be changed. We are imperfect. We are fallible. And without the blood of Christ, we cannot be saved. Furtick's statement is really a denial that we are sinful at all. And ultimately, what's, what's, what's most profound is he is saying that God is a liar. And he cannot be. If we were not sinful, if we are good enough, if, we, if God accepts us as we are spiritually, then we have no need for change. And then why did Christ come? Why did Christ die? He came because of his great love for us. He came to make a way for us to be restored to fellowship and to relationship that was broken in the garden. Paul tells us in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, Therefore, if anyone, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. Dear friends, I want you to be aware 
Beware of those who never mention sin. Beware of those who never encourage you to confess your sins. And beware of those who deny that they or you or we are sinners. True Christians know that we are sinners saved by grace. They know that they are not yet perfect. And so they make a practice of confessing their sins, of being obedient to Christ, of, of, of devouring the word of God. And though sin is the bad news, Christ is the good news. We don't have to stay in our sin. We don't have to stay uh, dealing with the ramifications of our sin. We can take up Christ and he can change our life. Be saved today and trust in Jesus. If you do not know Christ as your Savior, do not be deceived into thinking that you are not sinful. I'm sorry to say that you are just like me. Yes, by the world standards, you might be a good person. But God does not judge the world by the world standards. He judges them by his own. His standard is perfection. And we all fall short of that. But praise God, Jesus makes a way for us to be restored to him. The denial, the denials of a heretic, the denials of a false believer are truly the denials of all people who don't trust in Jesus. My prayer today is that if you don't trust in Jesus, that you would, by his grace, know him. Let's pray. Dear Father, we thank you so much that you don't cut corners. You don't um, shave off, off the sharp edges, that your word pierces to the quick. It pierces our heart. It makes plainly known our position before you. God, we thank you that if there's anyone here today that doesn't know you as their Lord and Savior, they can by faith trust you and be saved, believe in you and be saved today and escape the ramifications and the payment for sin. For those of us who are Christians, I pray that we would not be tempted by false teachers, that we would cling to the truth of Scripture. We would know what we know and never be swayed by falsehood or by un unbiblical truth. God, help us, preserve us, protect us. God, if there is a sin in our life as a Christian that we have not confessed, I pray right now as believers we would be praying right now, confessing that sin to you. Maybe it's bitterness or anger or frustration or lust or envy, whatever it might be, Lord, from today or this past week. Maybe right now as we're praying, confess those sins to you. God, as believers, we don't want anything to uh, disrupt our fellowship. We want to have um, wonderful genuine fellowship with you to see uh, your mercy and grace displayed fully in our lives. God, help us to make that a practice. We are in relationship with you if we know you as our Savior, and so we must act accordingly, just as we would in any other relationship. We must learn about you and communicate with you and let you know when we have failed you through our sin. God, we pray that you would help us as we leave this place to live out our faith, to share the love of Jesus Christ with everyone we come in contact with. God, we ask for your help in this, and we pray all of these things in Jesus Christ's holy name. Amen.